Uh, this morning, if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and what I'm excited about is we are not done with Easter. You never are done uh, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in this section, uh, we're going to be looking uh, at the, the death of Jesus again, which we look at every day, and his resurrection. Verse 18 is where we'll have our focus this morning, and I think this is a verse that should be memorized, because last time we were in Peter, he says to be ready to give a defense for the hope that was in, is within you And verse 18 is the answer to that. And so these are truly some of the hardest verses, though, in the Bible to understand. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. We have these landmines and oil gushers all throughout this passage. So we we have Jesus who's going to be preaching to spirits who are now in prison. He's going to say, baptism now saves you. And I thought about calling in sick, but I didn't think that would be nice to the poor guy that would have to take my place. Uh, Luther said, this is a wonderful text. He said, I do not know of a more obscure passage, and I do not know what Peter means at all. (laughs) So I I would like to join Luther this morning. So let's pray and ask God to meet us here and show us the beauty that is in these verses, really for the purpose of transformation, that we would live the lives that we've been learning about, the lives of submission to authorities, humility, love, love doing good in in the midst of men doing us evil, and and that suffering is the path to glory. We need the grace of God to be these kind of men, women, and children. So the the Bible is we we suffer with Christ now, and we reign with Him in glory eternally. And so I pray that God would show us and teach us that this morning. Let's go to our God. Father, I come before you this morning, and I do. I do. I tremble at the verse that is before us. I pray that by your spirit you would open it up. I pray, Lord, that every heart in here would see its glory. God, that uh, there's a veil over unbelievers' eyes that they can't see the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. I pray this morning that you would say, let there be light, and they would see that glorious beauty, uh, your beauty in the face of Jesus Christ this morning in this gospel. And so, Father, meet us in a special way. Use uh, this verse to empower us to to live these kind of lives. God, to be faithful at whatever the cost is in our journey to our true home. And so please meet us, strengthen us, encourage us, revive us. Use this to do a million different things. There are so many needs here, God, I pray. Uh, Just the way you fed 5,000 with a couple loaves and fish, that you would do the same with the Word of God this morning that you would meet uh, specifically every heart and every need, what they need from this passage that humans could only hope or think. And you know every heart in detail, God. Please minister through this word this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this is a a tricky passage. And as I was studying it, you can kind of get lost maybe in some of these details uh, that you could, you could really lose the forest for the trees, I think, in this section and come up with whole theologies on Christ going into hell to preach a sermon of victory to the spirits who are now in prison. You could prove that this is a passage on baptismal regeneration, that you're saved by being dunked. There's all these things here, but I, I don't want to miss, and I think the important part to getting the interpretation right is, is why, why is Peter bringing this now into his argument? How, how is it being written to help us live out godliness in the midst of an ungodly generation? Why, Peter? I don't want to walk away wrestling with these tricky doctrines and miss the beauty of what Peter wants for his readers, for us here this morning. And so I just want to come back to our context. These are people who are being persecuted and suffering greatly for the name of Christ. We know they have been dispersed and they've been kicked out of their homes. On the eve of the greatest price, uh, their own lives, a martyrdom would be required of them under Nero's cruel abuse. So Peter has been teaching us, guys, this is not our home. We're aliens, he began this epistle. You are chosen by God to receive an amazing salvation, one that is reserved in heaven and will not fade away where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in. And yet the path to our true home, please hear this, is not Fantasy Island. 
I said it in Ephesians 6, it's not a cruise ship, it's a battleship on our way to glory. It's not America, it's filled with trials and persecutions and fiery ordeals that are great, according to Peter here. And so we do not have to have it all now. We don't have to grab the gusto, as the marketers used to say. We don't have to be loved and accepted by this world. We don't have to be in the inner circle today. But rather, we can be persecuted and mocked and mistreated by this world. We can be rejected. We can be reviled and treated bad and all kinds of evil done to us. And guys, we can endure it patiently. As we look to our example, the example of suffering and then to glory. He he is our example. He came and he suffered, and he now is seated at the right hand of God in glory. And so we are to wait for our reward. We're a people who are waiting to get to our true home. We don't put our tent stakes down here and make this paradise. And so we need to remember what Peter's telling us is you're not home yet. You have not gotten home yet, okay? We're on our way. We're journeying, and, and we're in hostile territory, enemy territory as we journey to this home that God has prepared, these mansions that he's gone ahead to prepare for us. So let's kind of drill down then into this section. And I just want to come back to verse 17. Peter says, It's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. And so Peter says sometimes that God wills that Christians suffer for doing what is right. So you're going to go out and you're going to be living righteous and doing the right things and God has willed it that you would suffer and be persecuted by this surrounding world. We tend to think that hard times and harsh treatment are, why are you doing this to me, God? I've done everything that you asked for and all I get is this. Why? I thought if I did all these things, I would get the blessed life that everyone talks about. I thought if I lived in love and hope that people would just love me and they would ask me, what's the hope within you? Something special about you. I want to know what it is. No, God wills that you should suffer for doing what is right. God has decreed that into your life. And some of you don't even have a compartment for that in your thinking. And so I just want to start this morning by letting you know that God wills for us to suffer and to be persecuted as we journey to this true home that we might put him on display by showing this world that our hope is beyond this world. And if you'll look with me in the verse this morning is verse 18, for Christ, for, for is an explanation. So what we're looking at now is an explanation to that you're going to suffer by the will of God. Why, why Christians have to suffer for doing what is right. How can we be strengthened to do that? How do we go out? It's, nobody likes to go out and be rejected and spit on and mocked by this world. Nobody enjoys that. So how do I get strengthened to do it and quit being a silent disciple and shutting my mouth? I, how do I get past this? Well, the end of this chapter, look with me in verse 22. That Jesus is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. And now in the original, there is no chapter break. So look in verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore. What is it there for? Why? Christ has suffered. He says, therefore, since he suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So what Peter's doing here is he's saying, I want you to get that mindset. I want you to think this way. This is what is to come out of these verses that we have been looking at and we'll look at this morning. I, I want a mindset. I want you to be prepared to, to realize this world will treat you this way. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Get the right mindset toward your life here in this world. Keep that in mind so we don't get lost in the trees this morning. This is the forest. The forest is, this is a path of suffering that goes to glory. Just get that in. It's it's a suffering path on your way to glory. Don't be deceived. That's God's ways. That's his plan. He has uh, predetermined it. He's decreed it. And so this is good. Keep that in mind. Submit 
to authorities who are mistreating you and give good to those who do evil. And so what I see then in the verses that are before us is that Peter's going to give us a massive, strong foundation now under the duty that he's been calling us to do. And, and this morning, here, here's your foundation because it's going to get tested. It gets very hard in this hostile world. And you're going to need this to keep living this way when the times get intense and very rough. When they get very, very hard, I need a place to retreat. I need a place to be healed. I need a place to be strengthened. And that's what Peter's going to give us this morning. I listened to, to a pastor a few weeks ago talking about this idea, and he drew out something that I think is important, and then we'll look at the verses. It's, it's 300 years now of America. What has our experience been? It, 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 is it like the people that Peter is writing to in this epistle? Death coming for the name of Jesus? Is it common here? Is it common for people in America to be put to death for your faith? Not really, is it? It happens, but what happens when it does? We, we make movies out of it because it's so rare, and we want to show it and say it. And so it's not a common thing that goes on in our country. So if you look at the history of the world, he said we're not normal. America is not the norm of the church since it started. It is not the norm for all of history, if you became a, a Christian, it was risky stuff. There were many times and in many places that it could cost you your life to follow Christ. And the people that Peter's writing to, that is the situation that they were in. And that's the norm of the history of the world. And that is why the church grew throughout the Roman Empire. Every Christian knew that this could end in being put to death. All day long, we were like lambs being led to the slaughter. And so just do your homework. All of Christianity has had times of great persecution. There have been martyrs. Right now, there are more martyrs at this time in the history than, than at any other time. There, there are people being put to death at greater numbers right now throughout the world than at any other point. So what do you think your evangelism would have looked like in that day? How do you think that might affect your preaching? To offer Christianity as a life-threatening religion and believe this and it might cost you your life. I shared this a long time ago, but when I was at seminary, I had this man come to our chapel. <clears throat> His name was Randy Murphy. No relation, but I'm sure we go back to Ireland somewhere. And he comes and he had a ministry in the Middle, in the middle East to Muslims. And he said, if, if you get caught, you, they will put you to death. He said, who wants to sign up and come? I'll be up front afterwards. Silent. Wait a minute, we're just studying and arguing over every theological debate possible at seminary. We just sit out there and discuss all the different theological things, and, and all of a sudden we'd stay up nights doing that, and this guy comes in and says, do you want to die for it? And then suddenly all the theologians shut up. How would we share Christ if it was a life-threatening religion again in America? Do you think it would be God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Do you think we would need smoke machines in our worship and special lighting and lattes for visitors, special parking for tithers? The whole goal is how do we keep disinterested people interested in coming to our church? That's the battle in America. The last 300 years in America is abnormal, and I believe it's coming to an end. And we are crying and fighting for our rights to get it back to the last 300 years is the greatest concern of most Christians. Is that what we should be about? Or should we be understanding Peter's logic, his arguments, his examples, his exhortations to people in the midst of this? So that we might live this way in the midst of a great and intense persecution that's rising in our own land. That we might suffer well and then go to glory. That that would be our hope. I'll suffer, I'll endure, I'll be persecuted because I have 10, 10 million years to be there and I'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. This is not so much for a classroom this morning. 
But this morning is a truth that we can live in and we can live on and we can die in. So may God have mercy to us here this morning that we believe this passage that we're going to look at and it will undergird us and it will strengthen us and it will focus us to be what God is calling us to be, to put his name on display in such a time as this. So here's your outline this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. And Peter's going to give four helps so that we can suffer according to God's will by doing what is good, which has been the theme of this whole section. And this morning, we're going to look at the sacrifice. And then next week, a sermon that Jesus preached, salvation, and the supremacy of our risen Christ. So let's take up this morning the sacrifice. Look with me in verse 18. Four. Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And so I just want to start with Christ suffered. Christ died for sins. He, He suffered and died, and here it is, be ready to join him. Be ready to join him. Uh, We have koinonia, we have fellowship in his sufferings. Paul delighted in that. I love sharing and fellowshipping in the sufferings of Christ. Christ, the writer of Hebrews, said he suffered outside the gate. Let us go out to him. Let us go out from our circles and our approvals and comforts and let's go out to this Christ and suffer with him. Let's take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow after him on the Calvary road. I look at this cross, and, and the fruit should be, I want to suffer for King Jesus. I look at the one in this verse to this morning who suffered and died for me. I want to suffer and die for him. I don't want to find all the escape doors for persecution. I don't want to figure out how to live in this world and have everybody like me. I want to shine this light and be willing to suffer and be persecuted and rejected and mocked and ridiculed because of this one who suffered in my place. That's what Peter's going to get at. How do we suffer for doing what is right? Look to the one, the just one who suffered and is now crowned in glory. I think this might be the heart of what Peter's after. Christ triumphed over our greatest enemy, and what he did is he brought us safe to God. And so now, no matter what enemy you are facing, Christ has triumphed over him, over them. He won the victory, and he's now at the right hand of God the Father in victory, guaranteeing that all of us will join him. That's how he wants us to think. You're suffering unjustly like his. It will lead to complete victory with the Father in glory. Your your end is going to be so good. That's what he says. Look to that. Believe it. Fix your hope on it. And so let's try and unpack this then this morning. I've been kind of giving this a lot of thought, and, and maybe right now you're getting worked in this world. At work, they're, they're on to you and they're persecuting you. You're being mistreated maybe even by a spouse. And then someone asks you, what's the hope within you? What's the hope within you? Why would you be willing to be so abused and rejected when that's my life, and you're just responding so humbly To those who are coming at you, you're not putting up your dukes or slandering them. You're just responding like Christ, not reviling in return. Why why would you come to Christ then? Why would you receive him if you might die for it? And if you don't, you're going to live a mocked, persecuted on the outside the rest of your days on this earth. Why would you do that? What's the hope within you? And the marketers in the church for the last 40 years have found better ways than to present the gospel. To tell them, this is your best life now. This is the best life you're going to get. How about stress-free living? You're gonna, if you come to this church, you're going to have more friends than you've ever had your whole life. It's like cheers. You want a place where you belong and everyone knows your name. Come to this church. Because why in the world would anyone come to Jesus Christ? Or more to the point, why would they come to our church If we told them, this is going to wreck your life. It was hard enough to live in this world when you agreed with it. 
and now and we had the same values and we laughed at its jokes and we loved its movies and all of its thinking. How do you live now when you stand completely opposite on everything with the majority of those people on this planet? How do you live that way? When they're at the core of their being and their heart, they hate the one that you passionately love and serve at any cost. Guys, how is that going to sell? That's what they're struggling with. Who's going to buy that? Well, the answer for Peter is there are greater needs in the human heart than an easy life or a longer life. And the greater need is to live at peace with God both now and forever. And I will give up anything that I could have that. And I will be rejected and spit and scorned to have God. And God is enough. And that's what we're going to see in this verse this morning that God has promised to those who have believed. You see, when the Spirit does His work, when He convicts of sin and judgment and righteousness, you need something of such value that your sins can be forgiven. And I don't care, when I was in that state, you could have said you could do a million things and I would have done any one of them. It's when you finally realize that I'm a sinner and God is not happy with sin and he's just and holy and he's gonna punish it and all my good doings and workings can't fix that. Now all of a sudden, I will do anything to have the forgiveness of sins. Lose your life for Jesus Christ. I need the enmity between me and God fixed. Uh, The Christmas hymn that says, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled, eternal life. Present it, preach it, it'll cost you everything. I'll, I'll do anything to have that. That's what will happen instead of, let me figure out how to make your life more comfortable and add Jesus to it. He calls you to lose your life. When I have seen God's holiness, my sin becomes huge and serious, and my righteousness becomes a filthy rag before God, and I need a Savior more than I need breath. God brings every one of his children to that place. You preach this gospel to people who stand in need of him, and they'll give in anything that they might buy this field, this treasure. They'll be able to say, I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. Amen? I'd be willing to suffer and die if I could be reconciled to God. Peter's gonna show you that you have that in Jesus Christ so that now you can suffer triumphantly. That's the foundation of being able to come out of this world and suffer for the name of Christ. So what we're gonna look at now is a diamond, and I want you to just look at it with me, and I want it to strengthen your heart to say, I'll lose everything for that. I'll quit being quiet. I'll quit not shining my light. I'll, I'll do anything, Jesus, based on what we're gonna look at now. Father, I pray that you will just put this diamond on display. Give us eyes to see it even clearer, and let every heart now be lifted and worship the living God. Amen. Verse 18, 4. Christ also died. Christ also died. He suffered. Uh, I like the word also because what that means is that you're suffering. So Christ also suffered and he died. And some of these people in Peter's time are going to die as well. So it is. It's, it's looking at your suffering by looking to Christ. And they're just amazing words to go together. Christ the second person of the Trinity, the one who's fully God, died. That should arrest you. Christ died, and he died by the way of a cross. He went into the very highest place of suffering. In Hebrews 12, 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. Well, Jesus has. Jesus has, and the captain of our salvation made the ultimate sacrifice of death follow in his footsteps. I've been thinking on this just a little bit is that Peter said this. Uh, he says, for Christ, that's not his last name. That's his title. That's who he was, the appointed one. And in Matthew 16, Jesus says, who do people say I am? And they answer, and he says, but who do you say that I am? 
And Peter steps up and says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one that we have been waiting for all of these thousands of years. You're the one. You're the Messiah. And then Jesus takes that response and says, and I must be delivered up and crucified and buried. And what does Peter say? He grabs Jesus, not good, and he says, no way. That can't happen to you. Suffering and dying does not fit with my view of Messiah, of the Christ. My Messiah conquers and triumphs over his foes. And Peter fights this all the way to the very end when he says, it's time, my time is at hand. He takes that sword and cuts his ear off of the slave. He fights it to the very end. Christ doesn't die. That can't be the plan. And now listen to these words just flowing from Peter's pen. Christ Messiah has died for your sins. It's, it's so beautiful what God showed Peter and has done in his life. Instead of fighting it, and now he gets it. And his whole life and foundation is built upon now that dying Messiah. Christ died. And I want you to look in verse 18. Secondly, he died for sins. We're going to call this penal, which means punitive. <clears throat> he died for the punishment of sins. So my question is the most amazing thing is that the second person of the Trinity hangs on a cross and breathes his last. Why? Why would God be hanging on a tree dying? Why did he breathe his last and bow his head and commit his spirit to God? It doesn't make any sense unless it's for sins. And the question is then, whose sins is he dying for? They, they were not his own. He never committed a sin. The Bible testifies of that from beginning to end. He's a pure, spotless lamb of God. So he's dying for sins and they're not his. He's dying for the sins of the elect. All of the children of God that will ever be, he is up there now propitiating the wrath of God for those sins. Yours and mine. He died the penalty that our sins demanded. The soul that sins must die. If you take out the word for sins, the cross is just a riddle or a cruel, sadistic joke. His suffering on a cross makes no sense at all, but if it's, if it's not for sin, it doesn't, it's just foolish. And so I want you to look at him in total humiliation and shame as he slowly died. The public degradation. No vestige of any standing in society by the time someone died on a cross. He was flogged first. He carried the cross beam. His clothes were parceled out. And he hung naked and exposed for all to see. And he's nailed absolutely powerless, being crucified. The public object of scorn and mocking. To hang on the cross after death and the birds would come and eat him. And Jesus endured the cross, he says, despising all of the shame. And that naked dead body, blood soaked and battered, hanging dead on a cross, the object of God's full wrath for three hours, limp. And the question is, why? For sins. Your sin and my sin. If you can look at that, and say, what's the big deal about sin? You've missed the whole gospel. What's the big deal about proclaiming the name of Jesus and suffering and being persecuted? If that's your standing, you may be beyond mercy this morning. He endured the sword of justice. His father pierced him through with the sword for our sins. And so I want you to hear that this morning. He died for sins. And now you can endure suffering and even death without this at the end of it. So I, I look at what Jesus did on that cross and I'm not going to get that at the end of this path. Because he endured it, I just get reward and blessing that he has received now. Isn't that beautiful? My sins have been dealt with. Thirdly, it says he did it once and for all. We're going to call this final, final. There's such an efficacy to the blood of Christ 
that there will never, ever be a need for another offering. It won't be these priests continually making offering again and again. Justice was 100% fully satisfied on that cross. So it can never strike again for those sins that have now been placed in Christ. It can never strike again. There's no more punishment that needs to be meted out for the believer's sins. There is now, nor ever shall be, any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No more. None. Ever again. It was reported that the Jews would slaughter close to a quarter of a million lambs at one Passover. And now Christ dies once. Why? Because what was meant to be accomplished by his sacrifice was accomplished. And that's why he prayed, Te Telestai, it is finished. I've done everything necessary for your salvation. And I just want to read you a couple verses from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands like the temple, a mere copy of the true one, but he went into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself once, finished, final, then paid for. And fourthly, this sacrifice was vicarious. He says it was the just for the unjust. It was in the place of another. The just, the the righteous one. The one who's perfectly righteous. The true son. Uh, uh, This is what a true son looks like and lives like in Jesus Christ. He modeled it. He was perfect righteousness. If you've seen him, you've seen the father. Here he is. And it is the the singular. It's in the singular, the, the just one. The one who who did what was right. The one who always did what was pleasing to his father. That one that we looked at in chapter 2, verse 22. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats. He just kept entrusting himself to God. And, And in the Greek here, you would expect a definite article. The just one and the unjust ones. But, but you don't have that. And, and so you just have the just or the, or the unjust one here, which, which by not having the article, it, it draws out uh, the quality or the character of the noun. And so what we have here is the quality of the righteous one. You're, you're to look and just see this one who was spotless, blameless, manifesting the character of God. It's, his quality is unbelievable. And then to look at the quality of the unrighteous ones, the ones who have the stain and guilt of Adam, the ones who have self as a center reference point, the ones who have sinned against God from the moment they have been born, the the quality of unrighteousness. Just look at the, the two comparison, the quality of the righteous one and the quality of the unrighteous. It just highlights the moral character of both parties. And the amazing thing here is this preposition, huper, says that he, the, the righteous one in behalf of or in the place of. So Jesus, the righteous one, was put in the place of the unrighteous ones. He was put on that cross in behalf of all the sin that we have done to, to be put on our behalf, to have those sins on him now, the substitute, and to put him up there to be the propitiation of God's wrath, the bullseye of his justice. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The unjust is in the plural, which means all of his elect, all of those who ever have faith. 
Anyone who's ever come to true faith in Christ, it was the just one for me, the unjust one that he hung on Calvary's tree. The perfect one was put up on that cross on behalf of the unjust ones. He who deserved only the Father's pleasure and presence was giving what we deserve for being unjust. The Father's displeasure and wrath for our sin He now loses the favorable presence for three hours on that tree and becomes the object of wrath so that we could be given what only the just one deserved. Jesus, the Father's pleasure and His presence forevermore. I have that now. I have what only Jesus should have. And because of Him being my identity and my righteous one, the substitution, now I have that. Jesus said, Father, plunge your sword into me so that you can spare those whom you have given unto me. I pray that you never get over this. God did not just forgive your sins. He punished his own son on a cross until he was dead. The law said disobey and die. And Jesus bowed his head and he breathed his last under such cruelty and wrath to fulfill the law of God. What this should do for us enduring hostile treatment, for doing what is right and good. It gives wings to the one for whom the sacrifice was made. I'll endure anything for this name. That's what this should produce in the heart this morning. And I want to look at the last point, that he might bring us to God, that he might bring us to God. That's what's called a henna clause, and it's, it's a purpose. So what is the purpose that that he died, and he died for sins, and he died once and for all, the just one for the unjust? What's the purpose? What is the ultimate good news of the good news is what I'm asking? Because it's good news that Jesus' death has brought forgiveness of sin. It's good news that you've been born again to a living hope. It's good news that you have an inheritance that won't fade away. It's good news that you're going to escape from the wrath of God. It's good news that you've had righteousness imputed to your account. It's good news for all that we have seen in that first chapter of Peter. It is so rich. It's good news, but that is not the ultimate good news. The henna clause, the purpose in Christ doing all of this is what? That he might bring us to God. He did this so he might bring us to God. What we just saw in this verse, the sacrifice of Jesus gets sin out of the way between us and God. And it removes the enmity in our heart towards God and the enmity in God's heart toward us. It removes all the consequences, the the ruling nature of sin. It breaks so that now, people, we are reconciled to Him, to God. And I just want to make sure that you get this. Forgiveness is a means to bring us together with God. Don't stop at forgiveness. It's to bring us to God. I get God. That's what this gospel does. I was thinking of my wife. She's sick today. <clears throat> if you get in a fight or an argument, it's, it's not just the forgiveness that I want if I was a bonehead. What I want is hugs and relationship and joy and laughter together Again, I just don't want forgiveness, but I need that to get what I really want, back to that sweet communion and relationship. The gospel is that he might bring you to God. Is this what the gospel is to you? Or is it just some doctrines that you nod your head to? I believe in this, 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 this. Have you missed the henna clause in your own life? to bring us to God. I pray that you're living in a sweet, beautiful, communing relationship with God. That is what he accomplished on the cross. This is so much bigger than religion, to bring us to God. Hallelujah and amen, huh? So if you're ridiculed or reviled or mocked, Let's say ISIS grabs you, the, the group that just went to Europe and to Africa, and, and there, was a, there was a chance that they could have grabbed them. And let's say they get grabbed. I'm going to use Nick 
for, as an illustration because I'm, you're, you're one of the few guys awake, so I like it. <laughs> so they lock you up, and they say, Nick, tomorrow we're going to cut your head off. What, what do you do when you're sitting there in prison waiting the next morning for that to happen? Well, I'll tell you, Nick, and Nick would tell me this, there's a four in verse 18. There's a four that Christ died for sin, my sin, to bring me to God. And guys, these are the words that you can die on. And Peter did. And Peter went to a cross and hung upside down because he believed verse 18. And we'll, we'll be able to walk to that because I know that my sins have been dealt with. The just one stood in the place for the unjust one. And now he's brought me to God. And if my head gets cut off, I'm going into the presence of him forever. I'll suffer anything when I got that as my clearance, my heart, my life, my future. Having been put to death in the flesh, he was made alive in the spirit. This will be our plight if we follow Jesus at any cost. We'll be crowned in glory forevermore. And so I pray, guys, don't lose heart as the days are changing. Don't lose heart to be these witnesses and these testimonies and to live graciously and humbly in this world at whatever comes against us. And so as I close out, just one question that kind of hit me this week. As a shepherd, what I see most often is, do you, do you feel that you can just die today and be in the presence of God? Or, or do you, I gotta go do a few more things. I gotta get my life right. I, I, I gotta do something. You just, there's always something more that you gotta do. And, and there's something then you're not believing about the gospel to bring us to God. Are you enjoying communion with him or, or do you feel like I need to serve more at church before I can really enjoy communion with God? And there's all these things in your head that aren't true and you're not believing right that are keeping you from the full blessing of this gospel to bring you to God and to commune with him and to know him and to delight with him and to let the fruit then come out of that. And so maybe there's just some of you that you, you know this gospel in your head, but you're just, it's not getting through to where you're free. And when you're free to die, you're free to live. You're free to enter in now and be rejected and, and sacrifice and speak up. And all of these things will flow out of when you really believe this. When you really know even my sins were on that cross. My sins have been forgiven. Me has been brought to God. I'm here. I'm there. And now all of a sudden, everything's dead to you. You've been crucified to this world. And I just want to put this name on display that has done this for me. And so my life is simple. I've died. And the life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's my life. I give it to you, God. I'll, I'll go on Saturday mornings. I'll do whatever I can to testify of this God. I will be persecuted for this name. I don't want to spend my days hiding in my room, learning more doctrine and just arguing about it. I want it to get into my heart to where I'll, I'll die for King Jesus. And my life is going to be for him. And I'm not going to spend the rest of my days trying to be comfortable making Ken Murphy happy until he dies. That's what this verse 18 should do to your hearts. It's a wake up. Look at this one who, his name is Christ, and he died. And the reason he died was for your sins. And the quality of this one was the righteous one, the one who only did what was pleasing to the Father. For the one who never did what was pleasing to the Father, I only did what was pleasing to myself. And he substituted and stood in my place, and he drained the wrath of God for my sin so he could bring me to God. There's no, no more enmity. The war is over. I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I will be persecuted for the name that's above every name. Let's pray. Father, stir our hearts by truth. God, let us look at this cross again and marvel. God, I believe there's some in this room that need to believe it. They need to believe this gospel. 
Instead of listening to the lies of look at all my guilt, look at all the things that I've done, God, let them this morning be set free to look only to Jesus Christ. God, that we would look at this verse, that we would look at our Savior, and nothing else can explain the second person of the Trinity, dead, bloated, rejected by a world, unless it was for sin, and even my sins, that he bowed his head. Oh God, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Encourage and refresh hearts this morning with the beauty of this cross and this gospel. God, I would hate my own soul if I found it not loving Jesus Christ. He's altogether lovely, and we join our hearts now to just praise him and sing, and let us go offer up our bodies living sacrifices because of the mercies that we just looked at this morning. God, be glorified uh, by us, the unrighteous ones. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.